Hey Buckaroos, welcome back to another edition of Music Com Academy. Today we're going to talk about sales. I'm going to give you both sides of sales. So get the boxing gloves on. Here we go. Different kind of lesson today. I'm going to go through sales and how it impacts programming and vice versa. And, uh, and talk it through, you know, there's going to be some bad parts about sales that I'm definitely going to go through. And I'm going to go through some good parts about sales and particularly things that I think you don't know. Things that uh, I didn't know at all until I became a general manager. And, you know, and I had been a PD for a pretty long time, certainly been a jock for a long time, and talked to a ton of people in the industry for a really long time. Only when I became a GM did I actually, oh my God, I had no idea. So I'm going to go through those with you to ramp you up years in advance of where you'd probably pick this stuff up. Okay, but let's start at the beginning. And the beginning is this. Radio is a business. Okay, no surprise there, but here's the surprise, or what you maybe don't think about it in these terms. I did and I do. Radio is a business, but the currency is time. The currency isn't money in this business. The currency is time. Money is an offshoot of time. Time is everything, okay? And that's where the two things, sales and programming, intersect and start banging at each other, is time, okay? So here's how it works. Programming side, pretty simple. You want listeners and you want them to listen a decent amount of time to your radio station. So a programmer is trying to get listeners to listen for a longer period of time, or more listeners, obviously, but still, it's got to be at least over five minutes, otherwise it doesn't count for the ratings. So time is a factor for programming. More time, higher ratings. Kind of the way it works, okay? On the other side is sales. And sales wants to grab that time and sell it, because that's how the station makes money. They take that time and offer it to clients who will now pay for that time to be able to run a message on that time to go back at the listeners and tell them to buy a product or shop in their store or whatever. Time is on both sides of the equation. Only on this side, on the sales side, does time get converted into money. That's basically how it works. And what the bad part tends to be, which everybody knows, if there's too many commercials, you drive down the amount of time because people tune out. And that's one part of the equation. The other part, unfortunately, is that if you don't have enough commercials in the programming side of it, you've got a business. And if you've got a business, there's no job, there's no food for your family, there's no anything. Somebody else buys the radio station, probably comes in and fires everybody, and um, you know, and you're out of it, you're done. So you gotta find a balance. So that's where we start first with time. As I go through this lesson, I'm going to give you the bad parts that come up about sales and how to get around them, how to at least try to temper it. There will be instances where you cannot get around them. It, they are just what they are. And it could be quite possibly that your general manager, your sales manager, even the reps agree with you in programming. They don't want to do what they have to do, but there's some sort of a budget coming from you know upstairs, coming from corporate, that they're looking at it and going, I, 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 you know, all bets are off on this one because I can't make it. The normal math just doesn't work. And I'll explain that later on about the normal math, you know, which is essentially, but I'll go into it in more detail. Essentially, you deserve $100 a spot, but your budget says you need to get 150 Super problem automatically. How do you do that? Well, you can't get the 150 You got to put more spots on. You know, it's that kind of stuff. So I'm going to bounce back and forth between defending sales and not defending sales and defending programming. And again, I view myself as a programmer and a jock more than I ever did a general manager. I mean, I certainly knew how to do the general manager's gig and I you know, understood it all and was pretty decent at it. But, um, but I think a lot of that was because I always sided with programming, but I always tried to help sales, tried to find that balance in between. Okay, and that's what you need to do as a programmer. And we'll get into that, at least some of the ways that you can try to do that. For everybody, there are three types of salespeople. The rep house typically works on numbers. Their people are constantly crunching numbers. And what they do is they're taking calls, you know, from agencies who represent 
huge national clients. So it might be Ford, could be Chrysler, it could be Apple, it could be Best Buy, Home Depot, those type of companies coast to coast. And they don't want to go into every market and deal with every single radio station. So see, they hire an agency that will do the whole world for them or the whole nation for them at one shot. And the agency will come in with certain criteria that they're looking for. I want to reach this demo. I want to have this many gross rating points, which is basically, how, you know, how many people do they want to reach and how many times do they want to hit them? You know, how many times do they want them to hear their commercials in a certain stretch of period of time. And then the rep house will look at their clients, which will be a bunch of different radio stations across the country. And maybe in one market, there might be eight radio stations in one market with different owners who are part of that rep house. And the rep house will be looking at their stations and that, you know, that they, that they work with. And they'll look, Home Depot wants to reach this amount of people and they happen to be, let's just say, they're guys. Well, they're going to look at the stations that have a lot of guys and they're going to look at the ratings and they're going to try to manufacture, putting them together, the amount of listeners here, 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 here of those stations, put together something where they can maybe buy seven of the ten radio stations and achieve what Home Depot wanted in what they wanted to reach, the type of person and how many, you know, times they wanted the people hear the, hear the commercials and all of that sort of stuff. So that's what they'll do. A lot of times, um, the, you might be at a station where you maybe fit that demo, but, you know, and everything that they want, but they can already achieve what they want with other stations and you get left off to buy. You know, you should really be on the buy at some small portion, but you'll get left off because they don't need you. Sometimes it works in reverse where some one of the bigger stations might be charging way too much money and they'll skip the bigger station and move down a few ranks and take a bunch of little stations and package them together with maybe a couple of the bigger radio stations to be able to, to achieve what they want. Uh, it's, it's all math. That's pretty much what it is. And they're moving stuff around and, you know, and that kind of thing. So that's a national rep house. The local market agency rep is pretty much the same thing, except it would be in a particular cluster. So maybe if, you know, maybe it'd be some big company like iHeart or Cumulus or uh, Odyssey or one of those, um, you know, or Bell in Canada or Rogers, they might have a bunch of stations in a cluster and they may, this is one of those sales positions that doesn't, you know, it's not as prevalent as it used to be, but some may have them where there'll be somebody there who takes agency business on a local level. It, you know, it's a couple steps down from, you know, the Home Depots, the coast to coast ones. There might be somebody who has four stores in this city, but they don't have any more stores in any other city. So they want to have an agency and they want to deal at an agency level, but the agency doesn't want to go around to a whole bunch of radio stations in one agency person in a cluster will deal with that agency for all of the stations. And it's still mostly math. That's pretty much how it works. Uh, and most of what I described before is still in play. Okay. The last person is the local rep. This is the one that's got a tough gig. They really do. I went out on sales calls when I was learning how to be a general manager because I had to take that sales manager's course that I told you about and learn sales and live it and the whole deal. I can tell you point blank, I, I would have been a terrible salesperson. I, well, I shouldn't say that. I might have been good because I can come up with ideas because that's a huge part of sales is solving the client's problem with ideas. That's a huge part of it. But I just don't have what a salesperson has and it's different than a creative person. A creative person, for the most part, likes to be left alone, doesn't like to bother people, doesn't like to ask for favors, doesn't like to pester people, doesn't like to, you know, just keep coming relentlessly and, you know, and won't let up on somebody. But that's a salesperson. They have to do that because a typical local salesperson has to, first off, try to figure out who might be interested locally, some little small store, Maybe they got a couple stores, maybe they're one store and they're not on the radio, or maybe they are on one radio station and you're going to try to either get them off that radio station or get them to spend some extra money on your station or split it or whatever. Okay. So you got to figure out who to even go for. That's for starters. 
then you got to start calling them and trying to reach somebody in charge who could actually see you. Then you're going to try to get an appointment. You know, agents, like agencies come to you for the most part. This is you're going to the client. It's a different deal, whole different deal, way harder. Anyway, so you try to get the appointment and usually the client doesn't want to see you. They don't want to hear your spiel. They don't want to know anything about it. They, you know, they have their mindset. You go in and you start to talk to them and they're kind of like this. They really don't want to know about it, you know, and they're going to have a million objections. I already spent my money. I don't have any money. I don't know if you'll work. Yeah, that's a dumb idea. I mean, they'll go through everything. That's what they do. And, you know, sort of like a tennis player or something. The salesperson's got to be knocking them back. Okay. You know, just taking the serve and, and do keeping the volley going until finally, maybe, hopefully after a few times of talking to the person, they'll go, all right, here's my problem. And, you know, can you help me with this or solve this, you know, which now gets to the idea portion and the rep is going to have to come up with an idea, um, and, you know, to, to solve their problem. And, and they're going to hopefully say, well, okay, yeah, let's try it. They'll buy some time. The commercials will get on, you know, the station and you know, maybe they'll try it for two months or three months. The idea you know, a short, a short run of time just to see if that radio station would work. If it does, then probably you'll hook them in for a longer period of time and they'll buy again. So that's sort of the process. Okay. And it's a really hard process and it takes a long time because even like, if you think you put yourself in a big city, let's say you were in New York or you're in Detroit or you're in Chicago, you probably can only actually meet with maybe three clients a day just because of the driving alone. Maybe you'll get four. So it's, it's fairly daunting actually, you know, the whole process. As I mentioned, if you're a sales rep, you need to take a ton of rejection and you have to be relentless, continually going back after a person, you know, to try to get them to, to buy the radio station. You know, there was a, if I can remember what the phrase was, there was a phrase that salespeople, sort of like a mantra you'd hear at a lot of the sales conferences. Um, a no is just a deferred yes. <laughs> you know, a no is only a deferred yes. So you don't really take the no, it's just a, it's a maybe. You know, even though the person's telling you no, get out, go away, it's still a maybe, which is somewhat crazy in itself when you think about that. So that's a lot to do. You know, not a lot of people can, can take that. Not a lot of can take that rejection and actually be that you need a salesperson, which is different than creative people, you know, to, in order to be do that. And that's sometimes where the rub comes in sometimes because the personalities are different. On the other side, usually salespeople are pretty open and they tend to make friends, you know, fairly easily. So a lot of times they're maybe first to bridge the gap with the creative people versus the other way around. But ultimately you need to bridge the gap. You really do. You need to kind of be friends and each side needs to understand what the other one is dealing with um, so that compromises can be made along the way. So now let me tell you some things that I'm pretty sure you have no idea. All of this is in play. This is where I'm going to be defending salespeople. At the end of this, I'm not going to be defending salespeople. I'll be going the other way. But for defending a salesperson, here's some things that, I, that you need to know that I didn't know until I became a general manager. Number one, salespeople almost always in this day and age do not get a salary. Maybe when they just get hired, they'll get a, they'll get a token salary and um, until they get some clients in and then they'll get pulled off a salary and go to full commission. Now what full commission means is if you don't sell anything, you're not getting paid. Your family is not eating. You are not making your mortgage. And you know, if you're in the business that sales sort of goes in stretches where if you're coming up on Christmas shopping, everybody's advertising. So you can make a lot of money. But when you, as soon as you hit January and February, when everything slows down, most companies are not advertising very much. Same thing occurs in the summer, depending on your format. So you go through highs and lows. And a salesperson doesn't really know as this is going on, what their paycheck is going to be week to week, month to month. So they have to deal with that risk and that uncertainty where a regular person who's working, they get a regular paycheck, no matter what a regular person, if they just sort of phone it in and just do a so, so job, really, you know, 
as people do do that, they'll just kind of do the minimum amount of work, they're gonna get their pay no matter what. You get a salesperson that does the minimum amount of work, they're probably gonna get fired because they're not gonna make their budget because typically budgets are made for stretching, moving ahead, getting, getting more money than last year. And so if you just sort of status quo, you're not gonna make budget and therefore you get gunned and you're out of there. Number two, if they're good, really good, and they have a banner year, let's say you're the salesperson and they give you a budget of a million dollars. There's your budget. You have a million dollar budget for this year. And you go out and you're like, oh man, let's go. And you find a bunch of clients who are spending big money, you know, in different things. Some of them might be being a one-off. Maybe there's some big concert that's coming to town and somebody wants to spend a lot of money. You know that they're not coming next year. It's not gonna happen next year. But for this year, you land them, they spend a bunch of money. So let's just say with all of that extra work that you did and the other people that you bring in as clients, let's say you're, you actually blow the doors off your budget and you don't bring in a million or a million one or a million two, you bring in like a million four, let's just say. You bring in a million four and you get paid for the million four because after that million, you're gonna get a bonus. Now, let's just talk about bonuses for just a second. Sometimes just crossing the million mark gives you a set bonus and that's all you get. A million one is gonna give you just the same as a million four. You get no more bonus for that. You'll just get the commission on the extra. That's once other places have sort of like rungs. Million one, you'll get this percentage. Million two, this percentage. Million three, a different percentage and so on, so on and so forth as you go up. But here's the rub. Your budget was a million, you brought in a million four, probably for the next year, your budget may not be a million four, but it probably will be like a million two. Now you just had a banner year. You just smoked the doors off. You worked your guts out to get there. And now all of a sudden your reward is you got to bring in even more next year, which gets compounded by knowing, which again, I didn't know until I became a manager and did that sales manager scores. If you're, and you're the rep, and you have, a, you have a bunch of clients that will bring you in a million dollars last year, okay? This year, you can almost be assured, like 100%, that your last clients that spent a million dollars last year, they'll maybe spend like 850,000 this year, maybe 800,000, maybe less. And I'm assuming that your ratings are, are identical. If your ratings go down, it could all of a sudden be 700,000 that they spend because every year there's drop off. Companies go out of business. Companies decide to move part of their money over to Facebook and Google and then net, advertise there, maybe go to another station, maybe move it to TV, put it into print. Who knows? There's a million different reasons, but there's a churn there where you cannot count on the million that you had because it's going to drop year to year to year. So now next year, you don't just have to make up the million to a million two, you have to make up 800,000 to a million two. There's a gap now of 400,000, which is what you did last year when you were blowing the doors off, going from a million to a million four. Now you have to do that simply just to hit your budget. And if you don't make it, you get no bonus. You're literally going backwards. On top of that, here's what happens too. Again, had no idea this. This is really pretty common. Every few years, your commission, if you're the sales rep, your commission is going to get cut. So let's say you're a local rep and you're in some media marketing, maybe your sales commission, I'm just making this up as I'm not really sure what they are now. They're probably lower than what I'm saying, but let's just say your commission for direct sales going into the mom and pop stores and, you know, getting them to buy is six and a half percent of the gross of the buy. Six and a half percent. Somewhere down the road, it might be next year, it might be the year after, somebody's going to lower that to 6, 5.8, 5.7. Two years later, maybe it's going to be down to 5.2 or 5. In other words, basically every few years, somebody's taking your pay and cutting it. They're going to keep lopping it off for you and it makes it harder and harder. So if your budget was a million dollars year after year after year after year after year after year, and every year after year after year after year, you're hitting it year after year after year after year, your salary is actually going down, which you're getting paid because the commissions are dropping. One thing that goes along with that, let's just say, go back to you when you blew the doors off and went from a million to a million four, and a lot of math here, I hope you're kind of understanding. I'm trying to put it in really people terms. You go from a million to a million four and you brought in all these new clients, 
One of the things that goes on from usually from corporate, and it's just kind of what it is, I think it's somewhat unfair, but they'll go, yeah, we, we'd like to hire another sales rep to get another sales rep out on the street, but we don't want to pay them as just a salary because we don't know if they're going to do well or not. So I don't want to just give them a salary because that'll be money out of our pocket, our being the company. The company doesn't want to pay. So what they'll do is they'll go to some of the reps who are really smoking along and it's you, you just went from a million to a million four and what they want you to pay you generally after everything hitting the budget, bonuses and so on, let's say they want to pay you at this level and maybe this is a hundred grand. You know, that's what they want you to earn roughly and last year you earned maybe, let's just say, 140 grand. Well, what they're going to do in order to pay that new rep, they're going to take your clients away. They're going to take some of your clients, but your budget is still going to be a million too, and you still would have had the loss of the, of the 200 grand from last year's, assuming they don't take one of those clients, and they probably won't take one of those clients because they'll probably want to take a client that is pretty steady year after year after year, because again, they don't want to pay the new guy. So they're going to move those clients to the new person to make it easier for them to exist and they're not going to lose that person. Okay. So now what you're faced with is you've lost 200 grand worth of budget because your clients have, have you know, have dropped down. You've maybe lost a hundred or 150,000 worth of clients of that million four that the new ones that you brought in that went to the new rep and your budget is a million too. So kind of in a way you're starting maybe at 700 grand or 650 to make a million too. You almost have to double what, what you know you have as starters. That's a sales rep's job. That goes on all the time. I mean, you know, no idea. I had no idea as a PD. I had no idea, you know, when I was a jock. I went through a situation to, uh, in one of the stations that I was uh, running where um, the creative people came to me and we were in, in one of those upswings. It was kind of like an F-14 coming off a carrier where it's, you know, out and straight up. That's the way the ratings were going. You know, rating after rating after rating after rating and we kept raising our rates. Just for frame of reference, you can never ever raise your rates as fast as your ratings are moving up. So let's say you had a five share and you all of a sudden jumped to a 10 share and you held it for two rating books. And you used to get $100 a 30, you know, 30 second spot, you used to get 100, now your rating's doubled, you are not gonna get 200. Your clients are not gonna pay it. They won't do it, they won't pay it. It'll take them a while to get used to paying it and you gotta move them up little by little. Like, you know, because even going from 100 to 120 is a 20%, you know, jump in, in the cost of the spot you're going to get heavy duty pushback, especially from local businesses. I went through a situation where we were climbing on another radio station that let's just say, I'll put it in station A is the, is the leading of the pack. Okay. In the market. And they're getting $200 a spot. We're down in, you know, in the pack and we're getting a hundred dollars a spot. So 200. Okay. 100. We literally over about a six month period flipped ratings. Now we're the ones up here. And they're the ones down here. Okay. So you'd assume that the spot rate would flip too, but it, but, but it wouldn't, it, it didn't. And it couldn't, and it took us a while, probably almost about a year to kind of get there. And we were really pushing again, because inertia of sales enters into the picture with no one ever figures, unless you're on the line as a salesperson or a sales manager, and you get it that there's inertia in sales. You can't push the rates up too fast. Same thing when you have a really bad book for a couple of times, they don't drop as fast. So even though the lead station before, you know, blew their audience and dropped down here and didn't deserve their rates. And we did because we took their spot, couldn't get it. It's a, it's a slow mode to get it to move and it's work because you got to be banging on clients and make the case. And you got to keep pointing it out that, Hey, you're overpaying for that station. Now, what are you doing? You know, and we're giving you a bargain, take the 20%, you know, increase. It's still a bargain, you know, because on that station you were paying double. Now this is only 20% and then you got to do it again and do it again and do it again until you get up to that parity that it should be where your ratings match the money coming in. That's all part of sales. In the meantime, while that's going on, you know, the, the salesperson is getting continually pounded with, because you're going up in ratings, more and more higher and higher budget 
and um, you know, and it makes it, you know, it's no, it's no piece of cake, that's for sure. Anyway, I was in one of these situations where the creative department came to me and said, you know, hey, we're making these spec spots and the salespeople, because the rating's going up, they're, you know, they're making a lot more money than they used to. We want a piece of that. You know, we'd like some sort of a bonus structure to, you know, to be able to, you know, go along with that because we're making a lot of these, you know, spec spots. And what a spec spot basically is, it's a sample. Near the end of the sales process, you know, one of the writers, one of the creative team will go out with a sales rep and they will go to the client because they're, you know, he's close to buying and they'll, the, you know, the, and the client will say, this is my problem, you know, can you come up with some way of solving this? And then the creative person is going to try to work up a, a, a sample commercial that usually turns out to be the actual commercial that runs. So ultimately, other than going to the client's place of business, there's not a whole lot more work there, really. Because one way or the other, they're going to have to write that spot. It's either going to come after the fact or they're going to, you know, do it when they go to the client and, you know, talk to the client directly. But it definitely is time being sucked up during the day. But anyway, they're going to write the spot and then play it for the client. The client goes, oh, this is great. This is exactly what I want. And then the salesperson would then take over and, well, you know what? I think we need two months of this at X amount of spots per week, you know, just to get, you know, a, a repetition. You don't want to just do a couple weeks. It'll never sink in and they'll land the client for two, two months, maybe three months. And then, and then we'll see how it goes. And if it goes well, hopefully there will be a client for the future. They'll just keep going with it in some amount of money. Okay. So that's sort of how it works. So the, so the creative people came to me and they wanted, they wanted bonuses. And, you know, and I thought, okay, you know, that's, that's fair. Uh, let me see if I can figure that out. So I was working up, okay, well, if we do this much extra spots and we land this much extra clients and we get this much extra money in, they could have a piece of this. But at the same time, knowing the way, you know, people are, I didn't want them to just do the regular business and just expect, you know, more money for doing the same job. I actually wanted them to work as hard at it as the salespeople had to work at it because I knew they were working hard trying to land people and going through those objections of, no, man, I don't want to pay $125 a commercial. I used to pay you under. I've been used to paying you 80 for years. I've been with you for 10 years and, and you know, I paid 75. Now you want 125? <laughs> you know, that's what you go through. And if you're a rep, you're going, great. How do I, how do I, uh, how do I bang this one away with uh, with a tennis racket? So anyway, so I went to the creative department and I said, all right, here's what I do. I, I, I'll give you the chance. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but I remember they were fairly decent size. It was something like somebody was making 40 grand. I gave you the, I gave them the chance to make $60,000. And there was a pretty fair chance. Like I didn't make it like, oh, you'll never make this. It was, it was definitely doable, you know, that they could make 60 grand, which would have been a 50% increase in their salary. Their salary would have jumped 50%, but I needed to cut their salary from 40 to 35 as part of the package, okay? Because I needed them to at least fight to get to get a bonus to at least get back. To, I didn't want them to just cruise, you know, with what they were doing, okay? So, you, you know, and, and I'm thinking like, okay, that's pretty pretty decent deal. I mean, you made 40 last year, you're going to make 60 this year. And all you have to do is just work harder, you know, and do, even if, even if you only did half as hard, you're going to make 50. You know, which is a, uh, you know, which is a 25% jump, uh, you know, anyway, they all said, no, no, I can't do that. I, I you know, I, I need a set. They wanted a salary. They wanted no risk, no risk at all. And, you know, that's part of it. If you're, if you're watching this right now and you're a PD or if you're, you know, a production person, or you're in traffic, or you're in any other place but sales. Again, I'm defending sales here, and I'm going to get off of that in a second and go the other way. But you have to kind of understand all the things that are on that side of the equation, you know, that are not pretty, that, that you probably don't know about, and all the risk on that side, which you, on the other side of the equation, you don't have any risk. You might not be earning what you want to make and what you think you deserve, but at the same time, you're going to get a, a paycheck every single week, whether you phone it in or whether you work hard. That's kind of the way it is. That doesn't happen on the other side. Now let's go to the other side of the equation. 
We've all seen the Herb Tarlicks of WKRP in Cincinnati, those type of sales managers. So we specifically agreed they were not the kind of clients that we wanted her. You're right. See, their you... ads are tasteless and the company is disreputable. All right, all right. The ads are tasteless, I know. But Travis, in advertising, tasteless works. <laughs> I've seen some of them. I've been kind of lucky where most of the sales managers that I've worked with are been at a station, they, they were really good. Um, you know, varying degrees of good to amazing. So, you know, I've seen some really heavy duty, really know what they're doing type of sales managers. But I've also seen, a, you know, a couple where it's like, man, I actually saw one radio station where this is, you know, and I'm gonna go into what you can do here. Um, and it's kind of an interesting story uh, that I'll tie it into uh, to, to a story that I heard. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's still incredibly valid. I was at one radio station where a, it was a top 40 radio station and the salespeople had been with the station for a fairly long time and they had gotten older and older and older. And it was quite apparent that most of the salespeople um, who were older really only sold on numbers. They didn't really sell the radio station. They didn't listen to the radio station. They didn't like the radio station. They didn't care about the radio station. It was just their salary. And they only could sell on numbers. They couldn't sell on any of the great attributes of the radio station. You know, the, the uh, unique selling propositions of the radio station. They, you know, they either couldn't or didn't want to. And along with it, they were continually hammering at the sales manager who was weak who was continually hammering at the manager at the time, who was kind of new and really wasn't, you know, ultimately all that good, um, that we should change format. We should be an older person's format. We should get out of this kid stuff. Meanwhile, the kid stuff was at great ratings and, you know, should have been making a ton of money, but wasn't, okay? And don't you know that ultimately they got their way and the station changed format? Looking back at that later, um, after you know doing the sales manager's course and being a GM myself and being on the other side of the table, the correct response should have been from the general manager to the sales manager. Um, we're not changing format. This is what it is. If you can't hit budget this year with your sales reps, I'm going to fire all of them and I'm going to fire you. Get it done. Now, what one of two things are going to happen at that point. The sales manager is either going to get it in gear and start, you know, you know, pushing the sales reps and making them do things, or he's, he or she is going to go look for another job. Either way, that would have been fine. You could go get a good one. Okay. Because that was the problem. They didn't need to change format. They just needed, they had a, they had an awful sales department. It was terrible from, from the top down. Okay. And now one of the things that I heard how to solve that, and again, I don't know if this story is true or not. I probably should have asked Fred Jacobs. I probably should have called Fred and go, did this actually go on or not? But this is what I heard. And it doesn't matter if it went on or not because it's like fantastic story and it's a fantastic way to hire salespeople. Uh, you know, I would have loved to do, do this. I never needed to, but you know, if I needed to, I would have done this, okay? So Fred was the PD before he went into consulting. He was the PD at WRAF, which was uh, owned by ABC, you know, the network, and uh, in Detroit, and it was an AOR. It was a rock station. It was a great rock station. Fred had it really, really good. But here's the thing. This is the way the story goes. So let's say you're the salesperson, okay? You're the salesperson, and I'm the sales manager, and I'm interviewing you. And I go through all the sales questions that one would go through, trying to get a, a feel and ascertain whether you know what you're talking about when it comes to sales. You know, you know, how many calls do you make? You know, you know, what's your turnover? All the usual stuff, you know, what's your landing cash rate and all of that stuff. And I finally, I decide, yeah, you know what? I think you might be somebody that I want to hire. At that point, either with an excuse, hey, I need to get a pack of cigarettes or you want to go out for lunch. My car doesn't, you know, it's at the shop. Can we take your car? Or it was just a flat out, let's just go to your car. They would go to your car and you would start the car and the sales manager would go to your radio, turn it on and start punching buttons. If WRIF was not on one of those buttons, you weren't getting hired. Because if you didn't listen to the radio station, 
they didn't want you there because you didn't have any passion for the station. You didn't know anything about it, clearly, and you probably wouldn't care about it. And you were just going to be another salesperson. And they didn't want another salesperson. They wanted a sales advocate, you know, a sales disciple, somebody who believed in the product. Now, if I went out to your car and turned the radio on and boom, Riff was the first station that was playing, literally, so that when you turned the car off, you know, it was clear that you were playing it, ooh, you know, probably got hired big time. I just thought that was an amazing story. I don't know if it was true or not, but man, if you ever wanted to hire a sales rep, that, that's what I do, I would do, I would definitely consider that. Because, now here's some of the things that I think you can do to get a good relationship with your sales manager and the sales people and your general manager, you know, because ultimately you're gonna need that because you don't wanna be doing this, okay? You want programming and sales to understand each other's problems. So if, if a sales manager or a salesperson comes to you with like, hey, can you do this promotion? And you're looking at the, you know, the, the, the prize and it's like, oh man, I, I, I can't, how am I gonna do this prize? I, I can't do this. Instead of just saying no, it's I can't do this because the audience doesn't fit or whatever it is. Hopefully the sales manager or the salesperson will go, hmm, um, let me ask Mary, who's got, you know, so-and-so airline. I wonder if she might want to help me on this buy and they might want to ride this promotion and we can put this prizing along with airfare. Would that do it? Yeah, that would do it. Sure. Okay, great. So they're trying, they understand the problem and they're trying to help. Or maybe that person themselves had some other client where, well, all right, what if I got this prize, this prize, this prize, it became a package of Valentine, Valentine's Day package, let's just say, or something that they could name neat. You go, yeah, that would probably work. I can de I can work with that. Great. As opposed to just saying no. Um, so, you know, you want to get some sort of rapport going with the sales manager and the salespeople. Another thing is, if they're a good sales department, they are having sales meetings once a week, probably. At minimum, once every other week. And if they don't have sales meetings on a reasonably recurring basis, it's a it's not a good sales department, it's just not. Because in the sales meetings, let's say they're every Monday or Tuesday, usually it would be Monday, sometimes Friday. How do we do this week? What did you do? And you know, and it's everybody brags about what they landed and all that good stuff. And then you go back around of, what are we working on? What's big? What's, what's happening in the market? Hey, we need to go attack that because there's gonna be the so-and-so concert coming up, or this is coming up in the future. So everybody's aware of things that happened or so-and-so, this, this company, I heard that they're going out of business. We need to get our receivables in, what they owe us now. Jamie, can you work on that? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay I'll, you know, I'll see them tomorrow. It's that kind of talk that goes on in those meetings, and it's also role-playing. Just like I, you know, I was saying like, hey, client, I've been paying you $75 a spot for years, for the last 10 years, and now you want $125 a spot the sales manager should go through some sort of role playing with the sales reps. There's the problem, you know, I'll be the client. Let's work this through everybody. Let's watch, let's come up with an answer, how to deflect, how to come up with an answer for when you get these objections. That's what happens in the sales meetings, okay? But what you can do as a PD is to go into those sales meetings every once in a while and one, just sit there and just hear the sales meeting and or go in specifically or and or, you know, sometimes it happens just by accident, where they get to ask you questions about the programming or, or you start telling them, we got this big promotion coming up, it's going to happen in two weeks, and this is what we're going to be doing for ratings, so on and so forth. So they're apprised of what you're doing and they understand what you're doing. And uh, again, you're getting a report there and you're working it through. Another thing you can do when you go into those meetings, I've gone into it a couple times. I actually did one at that station that I was just talking about that looking back, I would have said, I would have fired the sales manager and the sales team. Not immediately, but one by one, I would have gotten rid of all of them, you know, over maybe a six month period. I would have blown them all out. Um, and that's because 
I was in this, you know, in the sales meeting and I went in purposely with a, with a, with a test. I had a test of like, you know, 20 questions and it was about the radio station. It was, you know, um, you know, what kind of music do we play? Name five artists that you hear on the radio station that are relatively new. You know, like, don't be telling me U2 or Rolling Stones, that kind of thing. You know, get, you know, name me five new artists. What's the show on at 10 o'clock at night? What's the new show that's on Sunday nights? Who's the midday host? I mean, there were simple, simple questions that, you know, any moron could answer. And it was like half the sales staff couldn't answer them. And, and the other, other half, you know, only could do maybe half of, half of the questions. And, you know, and I got him back, I was like, holy crap. You know, and I give it to the sales manager and the sales manager's answer at the time, you know, was something like, well, um, I'll see if I can, you know, get them to know more about the radio station. And it was like, really? Again, looking back now, I mean, at the time I took that answer because I'm okay, what do I know? Looking back now, having been a general manager, that would have been, yeah, I need them to know this answer and I'm going to come in with another harder test next week. And if they don't know, I'm going to start blowing people out. Seriously. I'm going to start letting people go or hacking their list down. Like I was telling you, where people take away lists, I'm going to take that million dollar list and I'm going to take that down to 500,000 and I'm going to make the person quit or they're either going to get it in gear, one or the other. That's for people who aren't good sales reps. For the good ones, they're worth their weight in gold. And also one of the things that's sort of happening now, a lot of the really good sales reps for radio, they're pretty much at the end of their term, so to speak, because they're getting close to retirement. And, um, you know, when they go, a lot of sometimes the newer reps takes them a really long time to get rolling or they don't really want to be in radio. They want to be in TV or they want to be in, in net or some other thing. So, you know, it's going to be a hard time for radio going forward as, um, as, as those aged, good, great sales reps step off and go into retirement. Lastly, from everything that I've seen, you know, in, in this business over 50, 55, coming up on maybe 60 years worth of dealing with the business, I think the ideal way, but it, you know, some stations get close to this, but they never get all the way. And it used to actually be this way back in the Drake organization when I first hit, you know, got the CKLW and the, and the Drake organization, you know, with KHJ and WORFM and RKO in Boston and so on and so forth. They actually ran the radio station's programming and sales as if it was an art gallery. <laughs> and you go like, what? What do you mean an art gallery? Well, the creative side, let's just say it's a painting. It's an art gallery that has paintings. First off, the painter would paint something and there's the product. Then the painting would get put into an art gallery. The painter now is out of it, has nothing to do with it, other than maybe going to a show and you know, answering people's questions and walking around and sipping wine, but basically they're out of it. They're not there selling it or anything from that point on. And then the art gallery then sells it. They make the case for selling it and all of that stuff. At no point does this gallery go, hey, Picasso, we need more blue. You need to paint in blue. Or we need more strokes that go like this. You stroking like this or sideways, you know, you know, we can't sell that. That just doesn't happen in that environment. It either sells or it doesn't sell. And in many instances, you might get something from the gallery like, painter, you're doing landscapes. We've had the landscape pictures up in our gallery and they don't seem to sell. People seem to want pictures, you know, paintings where there's people in them or uh, some other type of actual real life or modernistic. Is that a word, modernistic? But you know what I mean, you know, very modern, you know, it's just the boxes and squares. <laughs> anyway, you know, modern cells in our gallery, landscapes don't sell, you need to do modern or do faces. So now the artist at that point has got feedback. Um, nobody's telling him what to do, but he's got feedback. And the person can either maybe, maybe they would like to try modern, so maybe they'll do modern, or maybe do faces, or, to go all the way back to the sales team that should have been fired. You know what? Give me, give me my landscape pictures. I'm going to go to another gallery who does mainly landscapes in there. They don't have any modern paintings and uh, they don't have any face paintings. They only do landscapes and boom, lo and behold, 
his painting sell. There was nothing wrong with the paintings. It was just the, real, the wrong gallery, the wrong sales force. That's to me, gallery, I believe actually our business works best like that, but I know it'll never actually get to that. It's getting farther and farther away from that. And, uh, you know, becoming just math. But again, that's just me. Whew. That's it for today's lesson. I hope you got something out of it. Especially, I hope uh, I passed along things that, you know, I knew as a manager. I got to learn that I never, never heard of before I became a GM. Now you're, you know, you're armed way before you should be with, uh, with that information. So um, subscribe, hit the like button. The like button helps a lot way more than normal you'd think. If you could do one or the other, don't even subscribe. Just hit the like button. It matters more. Ideally, do both. So until the next lesson, see ya!